Cannabis Minority Report, powered by the National Cannabis Industry Association, or also known as the NCIA, one of the largest trade associations in the cannabis industry to date. I am your host, Khadija Adams. I am the founder of Girl Get That Money and the Green Street Academy. Here with your weekly news, check-ins, interviews, and updates with minority-owned companies in the cannabis space, entrepreneurs in the cannabis space, and also companies that support social equity and cannabis industry leaders, as well as pioneers. So joining me today is my co-host, the beautiful Miss Alexis Olive of Olive View Media. Um, and we have a very special guest that will be coming up later on in the show. Her name is Mika A. Brown Korea. I hope I'm saying her last name or pronouncing it right. Um, she is the founder of Babe Handmade, and she also works with Mellow Fellows Cannabis Dispensary. And so when we return from our commercial break, we're actually going to catch up on the latest Minority Report news um, and the happenings going on in the cannabis industry today. We'll make some um, actual announcements as well that you might want to um, tune in for. So we'll introduce you to Mika hear about her journey in cannabis and also get her take on social equity and find out how she's supporting um, her community right after these messages. We're very proud to be NCIA members. Uh, we've been members for the last three years and I gotta say every event, every conference, every uh, you know get together that's sponsored by NCIA is a good opportunity not just to meet uh, you know, others in the industry, obviously, uh, but really to, to talk about the industry as a whole, where it's going, where it's been, our challenges to date. We feel really grateful to NCIA for including us in the educational tracks the last three years. We've been at every seed to sale and most of the shows in, on the West Coast. Every time we're here, I always have a sense that it's not just another one of these industry conferences, that it's actually um, that it is the industry's lobbying arm and that it's an organization that is protecting all of us and fighting for the legal future that we all need. At the end of the day, the most important and impactful thing for us is the community. It's really about the people, the people that NCIA brings together and, and the events like this one that NCIA organizes for for us to gather. If you're in this industry, NCIA is trying to influence it positively for you. If you're not speaking up, if you're not participating in committees, you're missing out on a huge window. You know, everyone wants change. Well, this is one of the ways you, you do it. You don't have to be a member of the NCIA. You could just do nothing and let them do everything for you and fix all the problems that need to be fixed for the industry to work properly. And you could just sit on the sidelines. That would be fine, but be better if you were a member. Hey guys, we are back with the Cannabis Minority Report and guess what the latest news. First off, I want to say hats off to my girl Kimba um, um, Ogden, okay? So Kimba Ogden, and I say my girl, right? And the reason I say my girl, I don't know her personally, but I read her story and I am just uber excited um, about what she's doing in Nevada. So she is the first Black a woman to own a dispensary um, in, in Nevada. And so I'm super excited about what she's doing. She is one of three top-notch owners and still the only black woman to a, that's able to actually make that claim. Now, unlike most of her counterparts in the industry who's actually sold off their marijuana, um, you know, um, empires or whatever, um, Ogden actually held on to her dispensary because her focus is really being a grassroots um, company as well as being a part of the local community. And she's a former uh, fitness uh, trainer as well and at also a philanthropist. I can't even talk today. A philanthropist. Um, and she's also the wife of NFL Hall of Famer Jonathan Ogden. She's a mother of two. And all I can say is, girl, hats off to you and what you're doing over there at Top Notch. From what I hear from your employees um, and their comments is that you have really made it more about family and community and really serving the community and bringing more light to diversity and adding diversity in the industry. So I have a couple of things to say to you. First of all, you go girl. Secondly, girl, get that money. I love it. 
Love what you're doing. All right, so that's Kimba. You guys look up Kimba. It's K-E-M-A Ogden. I'm super excited about what she's doing. And then I'm really excited about what's happening up there in New York and New Jersey. Okay, in New Jersey, um, Cognitive um, Harmony Technologies, um, a leading technology company in the cannabis space is providing $20,000 grants to five minority run businesses in New Jersey in an effort to boost their chances of winning future licenses um, to grow and sell cannabis. Now, this accelerated program um, has actually received $100,000 um, from Pan Pangea Health and Wellness, and that money is literally to be applied for those scholarships to those five social equity cannabis um, applicants. Um, so super excited about that. And guess what? We're going to be interviewing David Serrano here in the next um, week or two. So really excited to get more details about his program and about what they are doing for social equity applicants in New Jersey. And so if you are a social equity applicant in New Jersey and you are listening to this podcast right now, you might want to look them up and see what the, what the um, criteria is for you to um, get involved. And then next, I'd like to say hats off to Dr. Bridget Williams over at Cannabis Can Ohio, which is a nonprofit organization. Um, and what they did was they actually partnered with Cure Leaf or Cure Leaf partnered with them um, for a great day of community cleanup. And I love what they do. They actually go around to um, communities where dispensaries are located and they clean up the area around those dispensaries, you guys. Like, they're not getting paid to do it. They're just cleaning it up because it makes the industry look better. It makes the community look better. And they're also recycling and all kinds of stuff for the community. So my hat's off to Cure Leaf because you partnered with one of the smartest women um, in cannabis in the state of Ohio. So hats off to you, Dr. Bridget Williams, and I'm going to turn it over to Alexis for more news and updates. Alexis, take it away. Awesome. Yes, I agree. Love what Dr. Bridget and Green Harvest Health are doing up there for sure. Um, so a couple of things that I've read in the news in the last couple of days. Um, so Virgil Grant, he is a dispensary owner of California Cannabis in Los Angeles. He recently acquired 120 acres of land in Humboldt County. So now he'll be over there as a minority farmer, um, which we definitely need more of those over there. Um, but it's very interesting that, you know, he actually lost his previous businesses that were licensed due to um, a seize. And then he was in, in prison for that. And so it's nice to see, um, you know, that he's able to continue his businesses over there in Humboldt County. Um, another, another news I saw on Saturday, the Commission for uh, Medical Cannabis, um, for the Georgia Commission for Medical Cannabis Access, um, finally declared um, six companies that they were going to give license, lic licenses, li wow, I can't talk either, licenses to sell <laughs> um, in Georgia. And so 15,000 Georgian patients have been waiting six years for this. So wow. now we may have to wait a little bit longer to make sure that um, out of the 69 applicants, you know, there may be some that are um, going to try to apply again and then all of that. And then after they finally sign the contracts, they'll have another year to open up their establishment. So hopefully, you know, it's coming soon, Georgia medical patients. Man, six years, you said it's it, been it, six years. Wow. And can you imagine the patients who are no longer here that, that was actually exactly all that time? And so what's what's their hold up right now though? What, what do people have to wait for now? Now they're going to make sure that, you know, so 69 applicants out of those only six were awarded this. So now some may come back and I believe, you know, um, just they, they may, what is it called? Um, just try again. And then once they finalize it, then they get another year. They, they haven't quite signed contracts yet. So we'll see. But they also awarded in that same uh, meeting, they awarded two processing licenses, one to TrueLeave. So, you know, TrueLeave is like the huge giant over there in Florida. So now they're coming to 
Georgia. Um, so I think that's pretty cool. Uh, I was looking at their stocks recently. Um, however, I did see today that some of their employees may be starting uh, staging a walkout on Wednesday for higher yeah, wages. What? Are so you that's that was just um, something I saw this morning as well. Okay, wait a minute. So you still a little bit of tea. You're gonna have to elaborate on that tea, baby. That's some tea. Okay. So we that's all I do. know. I mean, they just <laughs> really they're complaining about, of course lower wages, living paycheck to paycheck, and not having good health care options. Even though they do have them, it's still um, not ideal. So we'll wow. see what happens on Wednesday. Wow, that's crazy. That's insane. You know, um, I, I'm really interested in the Georgia market, um, you know, because it's a Bible built state, right? I really want to see them put something out that's going to be really beneficial for patients because um, I just think that the Bible built states are being left behind because of this whole mentality. But then we have to really look at it though. Reef of Madness really spread and stuck in those Southern states. And I don't know if it was because, you know, of all the prejudice, the prejudices that already existed, you know, in those Bible belt states. Um, but I do know that the mentality of the people um, in Georgia, you know, especially, you know, during that Reef of Madness um, um, era, right, they're still stuck, like completely stuck. And e even here in Texas, you know, like I had a conversation with, um, with two religious leaders here in Texas and just their line of questioning to me led me to believe that they were just completely unaware, you know, and that they were completely for that whole reef of madness brainwashing because that's what they grew up on, you know? And so to, to reach out for education about cannabis, number one, I applaud them um, for doing that because they want to know. And at the same time, I applaud them for wanting to take it a little um, farther, you know, with education and stuff and getting to know more about the information because they know that they're going to have to speak to some of their parishioners or some of their members of their congregation um, and, and be able to relate, you know, and have that conversation with them. Definitely. Well, listen, we're going to take a little commercial break and we will be back right after these messages. <laughs> My name is Monica Gray. I'm really fragile. My name is Sharon Medeta Jean. Even though I've been a member of the National Cannabis Industry Association for the last decade, this year I moved up my support and my membership to the Evergreen tier. With the help of NCIA and being an Evergreen member, we believe that we could push this agenda forward. Banking's always been my number one issue. Um, payment processing has always been a huge issue, cash payments. But now that the cell phone companies are getting involved, we need to make sure that we get minorities and African-Americans, people that have been affected by the war on drugs, indigenous people, brown and black people holistically needs to be a part of this conversation. It is so amazing to have a group like NCIA that has my back. Let's get you in front of these senators that don't know what it's like. And as the best of the best, and we want to make sure we have, we have a voice as cannabis legalization is moving forward. Government relations and advocacy directly affect the bottom line. Really getting to the table as a small business member to making sure that the small business member, um, small business owner gets a voice at this policy table part ensuring a smooth transition into federal legalization and regulation for our legacy industry here in California. Realizing that you, no one's going to fight for you like you can fight for yourself, I decided to take um, NCIA's support in joining this tier of focusing on policy. We need to come together and push for this agenda. It is critical that our industry steps up and engages 
We need to make sure that our voices are heard. We have the support of NCIA by joining the Evergreen tier as our lobbying firm for us, the little people. Cannabis business owners, entrepreneurs that really see the bigger picture to say, let's push this agenda forward. We can't do this without you. It is so difficult to run a business and be a small business owner in this space, in this cannabis space. I encourage you to join me and become an Evergreen member today. We need your help. Join the Evergreen tier and fight. Hey you guys, we are back with the Cannabis Minority Report. I'm just so super excited to introduce our very special guest. Her name is Nika A. Brown, and I hope I pronounced her last name correctly, Korea. Um, yes, yes. I said it right. Yay. Okay. So she is the founder of Babe Homemade and she also works with Mellow Fellows Dispensary. She's a girl mom. She's an entrepreneur, a constable, uh oh, um, a canna, canna um, concierge, as well as a music lover and a Roxbury girl. So, welcome to the Cannabis Minority Report podcast, Mika. Tell our listeners more about you and your journey into cannabis. Hello, 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 everyone. Thank you, Khadija, for that amazing introduction. I didn't even know I did all of that stuff. Um, so I, um, I got into cannabis about three years ago um, when I had an amazing idea to take my baby's handmade line and add cannabis to it. And I wanted to learn how to do that. So I went off to study herbalism, uh, fell in love with cannabis as a plant, and then, you know, just did more intensive study. And here I am. Um, I, I started working with Pure Oasis in 2020 uh, and quickly went from supervisor to general manager. And then this early this spring, I joined the Mellow Fellows team up in Haverhill, Massachusetts as the general manager. And it's been an amazing ride. It's just, Cannabis is fun, um, it's exciting, and I love it. There's nothing more I can say. <laughs> I love that too. Um, I know that you came from a family um, and yourself, your background of law enforcement. Uh, so how did your family feel when you were moving from that into the cannabis industry? Well, I didn't tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. I There's one person in my life who is, um, who's kind of my person, my Nana, um, she raised me and my other cousins. And, you know, I grew up in the house with my grandmother with, you know, with my mom, but with my grandmother and my grandparents and my great grandmother and my whole, like my extended family, I grew up in the home with them. Um, and so when I had that initial inspiration that I thought I wanted to get into cannabis, I went to my Nana first and I said, listen, I think I want to do cannabis. And she said, you talking about weed? And I said, yes. <laughs> and she said, okay, well, I know you and I know who you are as a person. So if you're getting into weed, then there's something there for us to get into. And she said, I support anything that you do. And I got five on it. And I don't really think she knew what that meant when she said it, but it means it meant the world to me. You know, like it meant the world that my Nana had my back. And as long as she has my back, no one else's opinion matters. Um, in terms of my law enforcement family, um, I didn't tell them. They found out just like everybody else when I was on the news. So <laughs> it just- now, now wait, girl, you know your, if your Nana said she had five on her, she know a little bit of something about the game. Now come on. <laughs> let's, let's just get clear, okay? Because nobody knows I got five on her unless they got five on me, for real. <laughs> you right, you right, you right. Um, but yeah, I just didn't tell anyone. Um, it was. You know, I'm, I'm 41 years old. And so this was kind of like a new chapter in my life. And I was at that place where the only people who knew about the changes in my life were the people who were most important in my life. And that was my husband and my children and my, you know, my Nana. Um, everyone else found out just organically, you know, as I was moving through the space, you know, if they saw me or they heard about it, 
you know, most of the family is just now like three years later finding out. Um, and it's, you know, they're, most of the reactions are um, really truly genuine and supportive. My other grandmother doesn't necessarily think I should be doing this. <laughs> I'm a good girl from a decent family and why would you choose this road? Um, but she is intrigued by the can of bomb that I make. So I think there's room for her to grow with regard to falling in love with cannabis the same way I have. Um, and That's amazing. Know, yeah, yeah. We'll see what I happens. feel the same way too. Like uh, as long as my mom is the only opinion that I care about, right? Other than that, I'm like I gotta stay true to yourself, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So let me ask you, what do you think that what do you think is the biggest barrier for African Americans that are trying to enter into the cannabis industry? Um, so I think for people in, of color in general. Mm -hmm. uh, minorities in this country or folks that find themselves to be the other in this country, the barrier- Are, are you rocking? Are you rocking? I think you're making me a little dizzy here. Oh, I am. <laughs> I, I, you know what? I am in a rocking chair. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm joining y'all from outside because it just felt better to be outside than inside. Um, the lighting's but, great. <laughs> yeah, the lighting is great. But the planes passing by is driving me crazy. But anyway, um, the, the biggest barrier to entry for people of color in this industry is access to capital. Um, there's, no, there, there's no easy pathway to money. Um, the traditional tropes in our society are what keep us from, you know, really achieving the American dream. Cannabis is no different. So the, if, you don't, if you never had access to capital, how are you going to get access to capital? And I, I tell people all the time, I'm in the Massachusetts Social Equity Program, but I shouldn't be. I have, a, I have multiple degrees. I am college educated. I have access. I know how things work. The folks that should be in the equity program are the folks who have no idea, who, the ordinary folks who have actually been impacted, of folks who's, who lost family members to, to incarceration, the those are the people we need to be knocking on the door and saying, this is an opportunity for you. How would you like to enter? Let me help you. I think um, some of the social equity programs that we see around the country are not really addressing the issue. They are saying, okay, you could fit the profile and you could put the pro profile and you could fit the profile, but they're not really reaching those of us who have truly been impacted I see my space in this industry as someone who can open the door to those folks, you know, as, as having been someone who, who has already run businesses before, I can step in and, and see the landscape and, and help be a gateway to other folks who, will, who don't know that social equity programs, they don't even know that cannabis is legal. They yeah. have no idea that they can actually you know, I'm, I'm in New York, New Jersey right now. And I did a workshop yesterday and the, my biggest focus was to let people know it's legal now. You can consume, you, you know, you don't have to look over your shoulder anymore. So if, if right. folks don't know that it's legal, how do they know that there's social equity? How do they know how to get money to get into this industry? So it's, it's the access to capital and it's, the, it's two pronged. It's the access to information. If That's we're right. not going to go to where they are and inform them, then are we really doing social equity? I mean, yeah. that's that's really the biggest right. thing. I agree wow. with that. Thank you. Yeah, I totally Just keeping it real already. We love it. Only on the second question. <laughs> Spill right. the tea. I love it. <laughs> I know, right? And it's just the truth. And I, I, I applaud yeah. you for pointing that out. And you know, Lexus, that was a very good question because typically we hear, you know, funding and this and that, but, you know, she touched on pretty much everything, going to the community, going where they are, you know, and, and re-educating them about the plant, about the fact that it is legal, you know, and they're in, in certain communities or whatever. Um, and also by informing them and educating them about the opportunities, 
you know, that's out there. You know, there's a lot of programs out there right now that's offering um, grants and um, offering all types of um, um, opportunities for social equity applicants, which brings me to my next question for you. Um, I know you touched on how important it is to educate the community, so we won't go there. We know how important it is. But I want to talk about your needs as a social equity applicant um, in your state. What are your current needs? My current needs? Cash. Yeah. I mean, cash. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> green, whatever the, you know, whatever you, the young people call it these days, but that's what I need. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm happy to say that I'm in negotiations right now to secure funding for myself. Um, Very good. Massachusetts, Massachusetts is fun. Uh, and I say fun because they create a framework and they, they created this complete online tutorial system. Here's how you do it. Now go do it. Give me some money, baby. Like, <laughs> you know money. what? I always say empowerment. You know, um, someone asked me, what is women empowerment to me? And I said, writing a check, yeah. right? Um, putting your money where your mouth is. And of course, not, you know, you don't want to write a check for anybody, but for someone like you, Mika, who has it together, who's run companies, businesses before, um, you know, and who really understands the, the dynamic, right, and the logistics. Um, I think, you know, my hat's off to you is uh, congratulations that you are negotiating funding right now um, for yourself. So as an African-American woman in cannabis, right, what has been your experience and what are some of your challenges that you're currently facing outside of raising capital? So I'm going to be, I'm going to keep it perfectly honest. With Girl, you. keep it real. I have been blessed, as they say, highly favored. I have been the, in the watchful eye of the universe because I got up one day and said, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna, I worked in my, my family's business with my, I worked very closely with my father, my siblings, my cousin. I saw my family every single day when I went to work. And as this, this growing tension was coming, like I have to break from this, I have to do something else. The hardest part, the hardest thing for me was telling my dad that I was leaving the family business. I mm. didn't tell him what I was pursuing, mm. but I was, I told my father that I was leaving the, you know, I, I was going to leave and I wasn't, I was no longer going to be there to support the family. That was the hardest part. Mm. Once I made that choice, I stopped working for him on a Tuesday. And by Thursday I had my job at, you know, my position at Pure Oasis. Wow. Uh, and then it's just been momentum. From that point on, I've been that person that just happened to be in the right place at the right time, talking to the right people. Um, so I can I can attribute that to two things, my hard work and the grace of God in the universe. I have just been able to to move through when I need information. There is there are resources there to provide it to me when I need to get to the next place. There is someone there to say, here's your path. So and I'm, I'm going to knock on this, this wood here, whether it's real or not, to, 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 to acknowledge and to say thank you to the universe and to continue to, to light my path. Um, but I also know that that is not the path of everyone. And so because of that, I have been very helpful to other people looking to get into the space. I have, you know, I have been willing to do free workshops and, and just take calls and talk to people to say, this is where I started. I can connect you with this person. I can connect you with that person. It's general knowledge is the block. Absolutely. Not, you know, even for those few folks who have cash, mm -hmm. it's just knowing where do I go? I, right. I didn't even know this was legal. Like I could do, mm -hmm. I could really do that. It's knowledge. It's information. Mm -hmm. I would say it's information first and cash second mm -hmm. because I, I come, I interact with people all the time across all income streams, across all cultures and races that have no idea that this is an opportunity for them, that this industry exists. Yeah. Absolutely. And thank you for that because you're absolutely right. Um, a lot of people, you know, go to 
through this um, life that we're living in right now, just totally unaware, you know, just unaware of what's going on in general, um, less known about the cannabis industry. So my hat's off to you for re-educating communities and really letting people know what is available to them, whether they want to be business owners, whether they want to be entrepreneurs, which is totally different from a business owner. Um, most people don't know that, but it's true. Um, and then, you know, investors and even by being operators, you know what I mean? And so I'm excited about that. Um, so tell me about your views on collaboration versus competition amongst women in the cannabis industry or women in general. I think collaboration is healthy and necessary mm -hmm. in this space. However, <laughs> it is not abundant. It is not in abundance. Um, I think that women are the way of the future, hands down. And for any of you, you folks out there who, who have not caught on to the train, please don't be late because you might miss it. Okay. Um, but I think that, you know, I, I just have to share this because I've been enjoying from it this morning. Um, Rachel Rollins, is, who is the Suffolk DA in Massachusetts, just got appointed by President Biden to be the U.S. Attorney for Massachusetts. She's a woman of color and she is amazing and progressive and is leading the, the fire. And I just need to tell the world that because everyone needs to know that. That is what collaboration is. It is not just, hey, let's get together and have a business. It is saying, hey, sister, I see you. That's right. Doing good work. Can I be of service to you? That's right. Okay. It is not just necessarily you and I and Alexa sitting down to the table and having coffee and coming up with the next business plan. It is how can I be of service to you? I do this. You do that. How can we work together? Absolutely. I that love that. Me, is what collaboration is. And so, and, and even me just mentioning that is gonna make somebody go to Google and say, how can I help this sister out? That's right. That, that, that is what collaboration is. Absolutely. Living, living it, being in it. Now competition, competition is also healthy. That is the first thing I learned um, in school is competition in business school, that competition is healthy. Um, it is how we create innovation how we constantly come up with new ideas because we, it, as long as it's healthy competition, not this unfair stack index against specific types of people, um, not this, oh, I'm gonna block you because I can. If I, if, if I get ahead of you somehow, then you should be thinking about how you gonna get ahead of me, not how you gonna stop me. Mm -hmm. You need to learn you know I, I agree with that. I agree with that. I think healthy competition is healthy competition. Um, for women in the industry, what we notice is that um, back in 2017, we had 36% of women in cannabis were in C-suite positions. And now here we are in 2021, just four years later, that number has gone down to 8%. And I believe it has a lot to do with that, that bad competition, the one where we, you know, this cancel um, um, society that we live in and, you know, I'm going to get you or I'm going to put you out of business type mentality versus, you know, let me um, compete, but in a, in a healthy way. And I like how you actually put that, you know, competition is good in a healthy way. And even companies that, compete, that compete with each other, you start to see them now coming together to collaborate on a lot of things now in this society that we're living in. So let me, can you tell people how to find you um, online, Nika? How can they get in contact with you and support you? So you can follow um, one of my many Instagram handles at MeeksB, which is M-E-A-K-S-B. Um, or you can follow Babes Handmade, which is B-A-B-E-S Handmade. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm on Facebook and Instagram at those handles. Um, I have a, a few things in the works coming soon. Um, but if you follow that, you'll be able to follow whatever Meek is doing amongst the many different things that I'm doing at a time. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yes. But yes. Mika, it was so good to have you it on the show. So nice. And we are definitely looking forward to having you again. 
Thank you so much for having me. I apologize for my delay. Uh, I just wanted to say one more thing about Mika. Um, so I actually met her in Massachusetts when she was at her first position at Pure Oasis, which was, uh, I think, the first dispensary in Massachusetts or in Boston. It was the first dispensary, first Black-owned dispensary in Boston from an economic empowerment application. So it was a really big deal. It was really, yeah. So I went there and like what amazed me is that they barely opened up right at the beginning of the pandemic. And it was just, that was just, must have been so chaotic at that point. But by the time I visited, it was in about September of last year. And man, she just creates such a great fun environment for the people that are working for her. And just, you know, and, but at the same time promotes um, and prioritizes education and just, you know, I, I just love the energy that that was there. So I can't wait to go visit you at Mellow Fellows next time I'm back in Massachusetts. Listen, if you thought Pure Oasis was fun, you you got oh man, <laughs> the things that I have planned for Mellow. Um, we're we're doing a community garden because food insecurity is really co close to me. So we're we're putting a community garden on the land that we have. We have this thing called Mellow Mondays that we're putting in play. We're, we're collaborating with local DJs. Um, just really merging the culture of cannabis and everything else together. So that's where I'm at. But I know this is live, so we got, I got to go because I'll be talking all day. So <laughs> we'll started. Oh, well, we love you so much, Mika. Congratulations. Hats off to you for all your success and for also re-educating communities and coming together. Can't wait to see what you guys are going to do with that community garden. And I'm definitely going to look you up whenever I am in Massachusetts. So thanks again for being with us. Next, you guys, we want to go over the mission of the DEI committee or the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee. Um, we are a committee, a committee that um, provides education, advocate and engage and empower the community of cannabis as well as our members by cultivating partnerships with other nonprofit organizations with similar goals, providing resources that creates and sustains an environment that is not only inclusive, but equitable and diverse. We are committed to building a culture that respects our members and celebrates their contribution as we work together to strengthen all communities in the cannabis space. Um, don't forget you guys that the NCIA's webinar series is back on top, you guys. The Midwest Cannabis Business Conference takes place September 22nd and 23rd in Detroit, Michigan. Okay, and yes, your girl will be there, okay? Um, super early bird pricing right now is available at MidwestCannabisBusinessConference.com. Don't forget on December 7th and 8th, um, we'll also be in Baltimore at the Eastern Cannabis Business Conference as well. So for more information about that, go to easterncannabisbusinessconference.com. And then finally, um, in December, December the 15th and the 17th, we'll be in San Francisco, California. And I believe Alexis is going to be in San Francisco covering that, if I'm not mistaken. But that's the Cannabis Business Summit. And so for more information, go to Cannabis Business Summit. And uh, we want to send a special shout out and a thank you to our DEI program sponsors, Tahoe Wellness Center, as well as the law offices of Omar Figueroa and Copper State Farm. So thank you. And thanks again, Alexis, um, for being here with us today. And Mika, we love you. Thank you for being with us. Don't forget, you guys, to download the NCIA's mobile app as well. And if you know of someone that should be interviewed on the Cannabis Minority Report, drop me a line at info at KhadijaAdams.com. Until then, peace, love, and hippie stuff. NCIA's Cannabis Minority Report is a product of the National Cannabis Industry Association and NCIA's Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee. We are hosted every week by Khadija Adams. Our executive producers are Aaron Smith and Vince Chandler. We are directed by Vince Chandler and produced by Bethany Moore and Alexis Olive. Please, please, please find out everything you can about the growing and equitable cannabis industry at thecannabisindustry.org.